previously in the complete creation. A lava dome grew over the next couple of years. We now know the actual age of that lava dome because we watched it grow. 10 years later, Dr. Steve Austin from Institute for Creation Research, now headquartered in Dallas, Texas, collected samples of that lava dome and processed the rocks through the potassium argon dating method. Five samples from the same lava dome, the same rock, returned ages of 350,000 to 2.8 million years old. Radio dates from rocks we know are 10 years old. And thank you for joining me. This is lecture 18 in the series, and we went, we've been wading through the very technical topic of radio dating to answer one of the most common questions people have about the age of the Earth. So let's put our brain in gear for a few seconds here. I'd like you to think through this logically. So here, down in the Grand Canyon Supergroup, that we discussed previously, we have a series of layers that were laid down horizontally originally. One of those layers is the Cardenas basalt, a lava flow. Obviously, it was also laid down horizontally as it was a liquid and would have sought its own level. Instead, it flowed out horizontally, solidified into one of the layers in the sandwich, that make, now makes up the Grand Canyon supergroup. Later on, the supergroup was tilted with tectonic activity. A powerful watery event sheared off the supergroup and laid down thousands of vertical feet of sedimentary layers on top. Then Grand Canyon was cut through all of those layers and even quite a big chunk of basement rock as well. Sometime after that, there was some volcanoes on the upper surface which produced very large volumes of lava. These lavas flowed out over the surface, down into the canyon as lava falls, even right down to the Colorado River, where the lavas formed a dam and blocked the river off for a time. The river backed up and eventually overflowed the dam and washed it away. These lavas that flowed into Grand Canyon are called the Ewan Carrot Lavas. So, with this big picture in mind, let me ask you a question. We have two lava flows here, the Cardenas basalt and the Ewan Carrot lava falls. Which one is older than the other? Insert Jeopardy thinking music here while you ponder this question. The Cardenas would have to be the older one. It was laid down first Tilted, sheared, and thousands of feet of sedimentary layers were laid on top. A very famous canyon cut through all of them. And finally, you, have, you had the dramatic lava falls flowing into the canyon. The lava falls, the Ewan Carrot lavas, would be the youngest rocks of everything in this picture, it would be younger than the basement rocks, younger than the Cardenas or the supergroup, 
younger than the sedimentary layers, even younger than Grand Canyon itself. Do you follow the reasoning there? There is a type of radio dating method which uses multiple samples from the same rock, and each sample is radio dated. You plot these dates on a graph, and if they fall within tolerance to make a line, the theory is that you simply draw this line backwards, and it gives you an age of the rock without knowing the original starting conditions we discussed in the last lecture. I showed multiple reasons why it is impossible to know the starting conditions, and without knowing those starting conditions, you cannot possibly determine how long the radioactive clock has been running for. By graphing out multiple results and plotting a line from those results, theoretically you don't have to know the original isotope ratios of the rock. At least that's the theory. This is called an isochron, and it is considered the most reliable and accurate method of radio dating out there. So as you can see here in Dr. Steve Austin's isochrons of the Cardenas basalts and the Ewan Carrots basalts, he obtained ages of 1,090 million years and 1,500 million years. Well, wait a minute. That inverts the ages of the geological sequence. Allegedly, the most reliable, most accurate radio dating methods show that the lava falls are older than the deepest rocks of Grand, of Grand Canyon Supergroup. This is clearly nonsense, as the lava falls are the youngest rocks out of everything in this picture. The radio dating method itself actually refutes itself. Now, for most of you, you can ignore this next bit. I already know there's going to be skeptics jumping up and down and getting really excited and saying, Dr. Austin used samples from different areas, and so the isochron isn't valid. All right. I will accept your argument if you also accept that this applies to the isochrons that the great E. D. McKee obtained in his extensive research in Grand Canyon radio dating me methods, because that's the process McKee used. Austin was only following in the footsteps of McKee and used his very same technique. All right, so the radio dating method actually refutes itself. But let's take it a step further. Over the past several decades, there has been a battery of different radio dating tests applied to the Ewan Carrot lavas, the Ewan Carrot lava flows, trying to determine its age. The results have been rather mm, wild, to say the least. <laughs> Six potassium argon radio dates returned ages of between 10,000 years old and 117 million years old. Might I point out that's a difference in age by a factor of 11,700. Five rubidium strontium radio dates returned ages of between 1.27 billion and 1.39 billion years old. One lead lead isochron test returned an age of 2.6 billion years old. And one rubidium strontium isochron test returned an age of 1.34 billion years old. So please note that the difference between the youngest estimated age and the oldest estimated age is different by a factor of a whopping 260,000. So the different radio dating methods returned ages of between 10,000 to 2.6 billion years old. How on earth do you know which age is the correct age? 
Well, I propose we go with the lead lead isochron age, seeing as how it's supposed to be the more reliable and accurate. So we will conclude that the lava rocks are 2.6 billion years old. Sounds impressive until you find out that there's Indian pottery in the lava flows. So we know the lava flows are actually 800 to 1,000 years old. Oops. You see, the volcanoes erupted and spilled their lava into Grand Canyon while there were native Indians living there. Out of both interest and religious rituals, they would place pottery or corn to catch the molten rock. People like Dr. Kathleen A. Van Vlack documented the paths the Indians took, and you can still find pottery, corn, and other items placed in the lavas, which cooled into what are now called shirred rocks. You can see her exhaustive research in her doctoral dissertation and some examples of shirred rocks on page 158. We're going to come back and revisit everything in detail, but for the moment, let's summarize thus far. When we pit different radio dating methods against each other on the same rocks, we get ridiculous results. When we use the radio dating methods against themselves on rocks for which we can determine the relative age, we find that the radiometric ages contradict themselves. When we put the myriad of radio dating methods to the test on rocks of which we know the age, the radio dating methods are demonstrated to produce outlandish ages. But let's take a quick look at attempted radio dating of a rock for which we do not immediately know the age. In 1984, a meteorite was found on the Allen Hills of Antarctica. Meteorites are easiest to find in Antarctica because, as you can imagine, dark rocks landing on bright white snow and ice you know, kind of stand out like a sore thumb. Given the label and number for where it was found, the Allen Hills Rock 84001, or ALH 84001, it went unnoticed until 1996, when it was brought to the forefront by scientists claiming not only did the meteorite come from Mars, it was 4.091 billion years old, and it had fossil evidence of bacteria in it. We will discuss the alleged evidence of fossil bacteria in a later lecture. For the moment, I wish to focus on the claims that it came from Mars and how they arrived at that age of 4.091 billion years. One will be forgiven for asking how on earth do they know that a rock found in Antarctica came from Mars? Now, it's an excellent question, and for the record, I don't have a problem with the possibility that it came from Mars. But on what grounds do they base their conclusion that the rock came from Mars? The excellent scienceagainstevolution.org website comes to our rescue. I highly recommend visiting their site. It is chock full of excellent articles and in-depth analysis of the scientific evidence surrounding the creation evolution debate. In their November 1996 issue of Disclosure, Dewild Jones called upon our senses, which we use for scientific study, and wrote, NASA says meteorite ALH84001 may have come from Mars because A. It looks like it came from Mars B. It smells like it came from Mars C. It tastes like it came from Mars D, it feels like it came from Mars, or E, it sounds like it came from Mars. 
do while Jones spoils it all for us by citing the NASA scientists. The conclusive evidence that the SNC meteorites originated on Mars comes from the measurement of gases trapped in one meteorite's interior. The trapped gases match those that Viking measured in the Martian atmosphere. In other words, the correct answer to the quiz is B. It smells like it came from Mars. One will be forgiven for questioning the validity of such arguments, but let's go with the flow for a minute, because the assumption that it's a rock from Mars plays heavily into the ages assigned to that rock. As Richard Kerr wrote in Science Magazine in 1996, the original age assigned to the Mars rock was 4.5 billion years old. Shockingly, that would place it as forming a mere 100 million evolutionary years after the formation of planet Mars itself, and the oldest rock known from any planet. However, in 2010, Leipin et al. concluded that the original age was incorrect, because the radio dates used minerals that weathered easily. Weathering could alter the results, giving an erroneous age. Well, isn't that convenient? Question of the rhetorical kind. How do we know that original age was incorrect? How would we know if it was correct? Are these radiometric dating methods scientifically solid or not? Notice they just tossed out a radiometric date like it was nothing. That gives you a very good indication of what they really think about the reliability of radio dating methods. So Lapin and team redated the Mars rock using different minerals and radioisotopes to arrive at a solid age of 4.091 plus or minus 0 0.030 billion years. About 400 million years younger than previously claimed. Question of the rhetorical kind. How do we know that age is the correct age? Lapin and team chose this age because it matched the approximate time of the event known as the late heavy bombardment, a hypothetical time when multiple planets, including Mars, experienced swarms of asteroids and impactors moving through the solar system. They acknowledged that there was some catastrophic event required to eject the meteorite from Mars and send it on its way through space to Earth. Leibniz and team believed it was during this late heavy bombardment event, which is believed to have occurred between 4.25 and 4.1 billion years ago. So they chose to reject the original 4.5 billion year radiometric age of ALH 84001 and chose to use the date of about 4.1 billion years old that was returned from radio dates on different minerals in the Mars rock. They chose that date because it lined up with the guesstimated date of the late heavy bombardment event. Question of the rhetorical kind. How do we know when the late heavy bombardment even happened? How do we know it was the bombardment event that actually launched ALH 84001 meteorite into space? Leipin and team also referred to what they believe, what they believe, are other meteorites from Mars with similar composition to the ALH 84001. And by their standards, ages they brought up in their paper, all of those meteorites yielded ages of 150 to 570 million years old. Question of the rhetorical kind. 
How do we know those ages are correct? How do we know that the age of 4.1 billion years, assigned to ALH84001, is correct? I mean, hey, they just rejected the original radio dates which were arrived at by very thorough radio dating processes. How can we know that they themselves won't reject their own dates later on? The point I'm getting at here is that they can literally pick and choose whatever dates they want. They will find reasons to justify the age they pick. In his exceptional article in Accent Facts from 1999, ge geologist Dr. Andrew Snelling documented the prolific problem of excess argon in radio dating. So you'll, you'll remember how that process works. A parent element, typically potassium, uh, radioactively produces a daughter isotope of argon gas. It is assumed that when the rock melts, all of the argon gas bubbles out of the liquid. So when the rock cools and solidifies, the clock is set to zero. There is theoretically no argon gas left in the rock. The longer the rock is around in a solid state, the more radioactively produced argon collects in the rock. So a rock with a lot of argon should be a very old rock. Dr. Snelling tabulates a very lengthy list of rocks for which we know the age listed here in the middle column and the age is given by the radio dating methods. Like the Hualalai lava flows of Hawaii that we know are only a couple hundred years old returned potassium argon dates of 1.6 and 1.4 million years old. Meh, it's only off by a factor of 7,000. Remember, this is science. Or the 1963 eruption in Italy that hurled a volcanic bomb that was collected and dated at 2.4 million years old. Some obsidian that we know is less than 500 years old, collected in the glass mountains of California, but returned radio dates of a whopping 12.6 million years old. The biggest discrepancy on this list, however, is the Kilauea lavas that were extruded in Hawaii less than 1,000 years ago, returning ages of 42 million years and 30.3 million years old. Notice that those ages are from the same lava flow that we actually know is less than 1,000 years old. So just the difference between those two ages, ages, is 12.6 million years. Just the variation in the radio dates is so wild that just that difference is over 12,600 times higher than the actual known age of the rock. Please note, Dr. Snelling has many more examples in that article which you can access for free on the internet. But as he points out, Zashu et al, reporting in Nature magazine, ran potassium argon dating on 10 different diamonds. And the incredibly hard diamonds had so much argon, argon in them that they returned ages of 6 billion years old. Obviously, this is an issue, as even going by the absurd age of the Earth suggested by deep time advocates, that would make the diamonds older than Earth by almost half again. Zashu and team then ran argon argon isochron analysis on the same diamonds and arrived at an age of 5.7 billion years old. Now, obviously, this is outlandish, 
But please note that the only reason it's outlandish is because even by their own deep time scales of billions of years, the diamonds are returning an age that's too old. Question of the rhetorical kind. How did we know that age was too old? What if the age had come back at, say, 3 billion years old? Would they have rejected that age then? Are these ages absolute and reliable or not? We're going to circle back to diamonds later on, as they have provided strange and incredibly unusual ways of verifying the actual age of the Earth. But in the meantime, I'm out of time for this lecture. I hope you'll join me again as we continue our journey through the complete creation. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. So here we are, having dozens to hundreds of different samples of measurements, using multiple dating methods, giving us ages that confirm and corroborate each other. It is then the evolutionists and deep time advocates themselves who go on to reject their own dates. Obviously, they themselves do not honestly believe that radiometric dating methods are reliable and irrefutable. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.